So my name is Kobe Jensen. I'm an MS1 at LLU, and I'm going to talk to you today about artificial intelligence and ultrasound. Kobe, oh, can you turn on your um, video too? So whoever's presenting should uh, turn yeah. on. Yeah. You can start from the beginning again too, because we're recording, but yeah. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kobe Jensen. I'm an MS1 at LLU. And today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about artificial intelligence and ultrasound. Um, so artificial intelligence is a very broad term and we use it loosely to describe a lot of things. And so I just included this graph here to really show how broad it truly is. It's a very umbrella term that captures a lot of different things. And today I'm gonna to focus mostly on the right side here which is machine learning, which is probably most applicable to ultrasound. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about the process of machine learning. So in general, machine learning um, has five steps. Your first, you're gonna get the data, right? So we're gonna do a lot, a lot of ultrasounds and get a lot of images. From there, we're gonna go through those, eliminate the images that you don't think are good or that you don't want, and you're gonna go through and label them, and you're gonna use those images to train an algorithm or a model per se. And then at that point, you're going to test it, see if it's working, and then obviously there's room for improvement. Um, so in ultrasound, though, there are some very unique um, difficulties that, that come with this compared to other imaging techniques. So as we know, in ultrasound, it can be very difficult to get the image you want sometimes. And someone who is very skilled versus someone who's not will very likely get a different quality of image. And we also know that shadowing in different bodies can create different issues, and the person's habitus can also greatly affect that. So there comes a, a, an important question to ask, and that is what data should be used to train the AI or the model? Because whatever we train the model to read, to know, that is going to greatly affect the outcome. So do we only use the best of the best images to train a model? And in that case, will the model not be effective for someone who's not good at ultrasound? So there's a lot of debate to go into, you know, what images should we use when training an AI model? Um, so just go through a quick example here with lungs, and we're going to look at bee lines. And when we're going through the data, you're going to get a lot of different lungs, look a lot of different samples, and you're going to have someone go through it. They're going to say, oh, hey, this image here is going to have one, two, three, four bee lines. Um, someone else might argue, no, this one's a little bigger. There's going to be two bee lines that are together. So not only is there an issue with, you know, what images do you use, but now there might be disagreement between experts on how to label data. And so there's a lot to go into deciding um, how to train the AI. And obviously the AI will only be as good as the training that goes into it. And so it's very important to, to realize when you are using AI, that it's only as good as the data that's been put into it. And if garbage goes in, garbage comes out. If awesome images and great quality goes in, well, then you're going to have a really effective AI. So currently in the ultrasound world and medicine, there is a lot of application that AI is already being used for. And it is just growing more and more and will, just like it is in every other sector in healthcare and other, other sectors in the world. Um, so one that I found really interesting was a real-time ejection fraction application. And it requires an apical four-chamber view of the heart. And I thought this one of the AI programs that I thought was really cool was able to give feedback on the quality image. So rather than, you know, saying, hey, like, this is only going to work with great images, it actually is going to tell you there while you're doing it, the quality of the image and the calculation and outputs is greatly dependent on that. And so it basically breaks down to three colors, green, yellow, and red. And we'll go through a few of those photos and see that in a second. And I also thought it was cool how it also, in addition to calculating ejection fraction, it calculated end systolic and end diastolic volume in the left ventricle. And so here's the image here. As I was talking about those colors, you can see here it outlines the left ventricle automatically in a color. And this one's yellow meaning that it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a good view, but it could be better. And here's one where, hey, you got a really good view, it's green. This is when the AI is gonna be the best and gonna give you the best output. And here you can see the ejection fraction it's giving. And once again, if you have a poor image, it's gonna let you know, hey, we can't, the AI model will not work until you get a better image. Um, and then once again, here you can see you can click back and forth and get some different measurements all in real time, which I thought can be super helpful. Um, oftentimes we think, hey, oh, hey, you know, we can do this. We don't need AI to do this. What's incredible about it is, you know, someone might take a minute or two to do this on every patient. Well, with AI, it can be done immediately. And it's really beneficial when we can take more time to discussing with patients and doing other things that are more important when AI is able to help us save time doing these little things. 
Um, now the important matter is, is it accurate? And like I mentioned before, the data that you build your model off is crucial. And so one model that I looked into on a study, uh, they, they basically compared this, um, its ability against physicians who have been trained using ultrasound and they are rating the ejection fraction as severely reduced, reduced, normal, or hyperdynamic. And here's the predicted, and you have the actual over here. And in general, we see that this model is pretty close to the physicians in accuracy, um, which I thought was pretty incredible. And I do know that it's just gonna get better and better. And that's what really excites me about AI. Um, another thing that's also very effective for is thyroid nodules. I remember when I learned about this, I feel like it could be very hard to tell these apart sometime, a malignant one versus a benign one. Um, but I think it's really cool how you can just use so many images to train an AI model to do this for you. And here is once again, showing the accuracy of these AI models. So don't pay attention to this top line as that was for training purposes, but these bottom three, if your junior radiologist, a senior radiologist and their AI model. And in general, the AI model was able to do just as good as a senior radiologist, if not better. So I thought that was pretty cool. Another one that's become more popular and more accessible and probably being used the most is the bladder volume. Most companies have a bladder volume one where they can just either, they have to fan through the bladder or the probe will automatically fan through the bladder for them and will give you a very quick bladder volume. In addition to those, there are many other applications for ultrasound, such as a uterine fibroid exam, fetal exam tools, breast exam, auto renal measures, and auto labeling. And all these things are, are out there currently being used. And I thought that was really cool. I didn't realize how much AI was already being used in ultrasound. And I, I also found the fetal exam to be really interesting. As my wife recently had a baby, we were in for ultrasounds a lot. And a lot of times they were a half hour to an hour. But the AI currently out there is really focusing on decreasing the time it takes to do all the measurements. And I thought that was really cool. And here are some of those companies that are really heading this. Um, obviously it's not all of them, but there are some of the main ones. Now the real question is, is we're students in medicine, what's the future of AI gonna look like for us in ultrasound? How are we gonna be using it when we're in practice? And as it's obviously impossible to predict the future, I think we can easily know that AI is becoming more popular in all aspects of our life and ultrasound is no exception. So here is kind of a, uh, a graph showing the prediction of AI and healthcare in general. I wasn't able to find anything specifically to ultrasound, but I believe that ultrasound will follow the general market trend of AI and healthcare. And we can see that it is gonna become very, very prevalent in our practices. Um, and so it's important that we learn about it now and learn how to really take, take it and use it and make the most of it because it will really make it so we can be more effective physicians and help more people.